personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Thanks for joining us today on the Resistance Library Podcast. I am your host, Sam Jacobs. Today I'm here with the assistant editor of American Greatness, which is a great website. Um, I reference it a lot on here. You guys should definitely go check it out. His name is Pedro L. Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here, Sam. So I know that you have a lot of opinions on this, and this is one of the reasons why I want to kind of broach it with you. Um, because I think you have a lot of valuable insight on it. But what do you consider the main lessons of both the 2020 presidential election and the recent Georgia runoffs um, and, uh, you know, Senate runoffs to be for the GOP, both in terms of what what they went, what went wrong and what they need to do going forward? I think that they're connected, but different in terms of starting with Georgia first, because that's more recent there is a, a kind of debate right now over who is to blame. Is it Trump or is it the GOP? I think it's probably both. Trump, if you recall, campaigned for Purdue and Loeffler, even after Purdue was caught on tape saying that he looks forward to compromising with Biden in a way that compromising with Democrats was impossible under Trump, uh, and still Trump threw his weight behind them. And certainly he had critical remarks for Republicans in Georgia, but still he campaigned for them. So it's not fair to say it was entirely Trump's fault, but it's also not fair to say it wasn't the GOP's fault in Georgia because they thought it was a great idea or Mitch McConnell thought it was a great idea to not do stimulus ahead of the Senate runoff race. So in other words, the GOP didn't give people a reason to vote for them. They also didn't take, uh, let's call them irregularities around the election seriously, because whether the GOP likes it or not, the Republican base is very much aligned with Trump. And if Trump says that there was fraud and that there were these really serious irregularities that need to be investigated, and the GOP's answer is to basically say, no, uh, we're not going to take any of that seriously and we're going to drag our feet on this, then again, you're not really giving your voters a reason to turn out for you. So I think that both sides in Georgia can come away with this with blame. But that said, I have a lot of contempt for the GOP in general. So uh, I, I was never, I never took a, a, a camp in this fight, but I did point out, you know, that th- these little tensions that kept occurring in Georgia, like you had the America first people led by Nick Fuentes and, uh, Ali Alexander and, and that group, right? They were they were calling for the GOP to bur- be burned to the ground, which I kind of agree with actually. But they were saying we're not go- like we are not going to vote for the GOP. And then you have Trump, who they're fighting for, saying actually you should vote for the GOP in Georgia. And it's it's weird because that that tension never got resolved between the America First people and Trump himself. And then you saw it again actually at the Capitol riots where. The America First people were saying, we're not going to apologize. This was a disaster. Or actually, it wasn't even a disaster. We're not going to call it that. And then the day later, Trump condemns that. Uh, Trump condemns the riot at the Capitol building. So it, it's it's interesting. You have this dynamic where you have like basically three camps. Trump, his, his hardcore base, and the GOP. And you saw that play out in Georgia, and you saw it play out in the Capitol building. Uh, the riot at the Capitol building. As far as the the, the 2020 election, though, um, I think the takeaway from that is that Trump was always a transitional figure. And I've been telling this to my friends who are being kind of Cassandras right now and saying you know, all is lost and uh, there is no future anymore and that Trump was the, the last political solution. I totally disagree with that. And I actually think that that uh, the left actually has a better understanding of the 2020 outcome than the right does, at least right now. And that is that Trump was ineffective as a as a leader. 
and that he did not competently exercise power, and that the left can basically count their blessings for this to be over. Uh, because the next person, if there is a next person, and I think there will be, but the left knows that it's an if, uh, if there's someone else after Trump, they will have learned from Trump's mistakes and be far more competent and therefore far more dangerous. And I think that is the big takeaway from the 2020 election, that one, Trump was always transitional, and two, uh, that, that we should be looking forward and that we should be learning from the mistakes that Trump made and taking the good and separating it from the bad, but continuing forward and not kind of galvanizing ourselves only to Trump and putting all of our eggs in that basket. I think that's all really insightful. And, and I've kind of said, you know, for years now that I think that whoever comes after Trump, who will probably, again, like learn from the lessons of, of, of what went wrong with the Trump administration, um, I think will probably be a, a bit of a juggernaut because they'll be able to, you know, figure out figure out what worked, figure out what didn't, and the, and the, and and the knowledge that comes out of that, I think, will make them a very very formidable candidate. So, in terms of going forward, you know, what do you think that the Republican Party slash Trump's voters, because there's there's overlap on this Venn diagram, but I think that we can talk about them as separate but overlapping groups of people. Um, what are what, you know? What can they kind of do going forward? What's the plan? Well, I think the first order of business is asking ourselves what is Trumpism. There is this concept that seems obvious enough: the friend enemy distinction, right? Made famous by Carl Schmitt, and that presupposes that you understand who your enemies are and who your allies are, which again seems simple enough. You know, know who good, know who bad. But when we look back on the Trump administration, we see actually that Trump, or at least it would appear to be the case that almost exclusively he rewarded enemies and punished allies in terms of who got jobs in the administration and who resigned or or was let go. So like a few examples, you had, I think this is in chronological order, you had Steve Bannon, Seb Gorka, and Michael Anton resign for various reasons. Early on, basically by 2018 was, I think, when Anton left. And I, I cite these people because regardless of what you might think of them intellectually or their disposition or whatever, uh, they were the most clearly aligned with the ideas of 2016, right? There's no question about that. Michael Anton wrote the Flight 93 essay, said Gorka, say what you will about him. At least, you know, his his disposition is correct and his, his attitude is correct. Same thing with Bannon. These are people who are at least aligned with the concept of America first, far more so than, say, Jared Kushner or Ivanka Trump or Brooke Rollins, people like that who are all senior uh, people in the White House. So they were all gone basically by 2018. And, and the remaining staff who were aligned with us um, could only survive by keeping their heads down, which is, I think, something that will come out as time goes on. It, it's going to dawn on people that even guys like Stephen Miller, the big boogeyman, right? The, the right thinks he's super based and the left thinks that he's literally Hitler. Both of these characterizations miss the mark. Stephen Miller has survived by keeping his head down and allowing himself to become neutralized. Because if, I mean, think about it. If Seb Gorka is gone and Miller is supposed to be like this hardcore right figure, how would Miller survive in the White House? Unless he allowed himself to kind of be leashed and corralled, which is, again, something that Trump supporters don't want to hear, but they need to hear. And eventually, I think uh, they're going to accept this. So, again, what is Trumpism? Uh, what is Trumpism to the people who voted for Trump? And what is Trumpism to Trump? Who are the friends and who are the enemies? These are the questions that I think we need to ask right now going forward. And there is, I think, a guide for this. So it's not like we're just flying blind. And that guide is, uh, conveniently enough, the 2016 platform. 
the the basic planks of the original America First mandate. Those are the things that I think we can look back on and, and one, say Trump won by running on these things. And two, these things still have broad appeal. And how do we know that? Because if you recall, in many ways, Bernie Sanders had a very similar uh, initial candidacy as Donald Trump. On immigration, they were very similar. And they talked about the corporate world in a very similar fashion. Basically, uh, they were adversarial towards it, right? But that all changed in time. But nevertheless, the point is, is that these ideas have broad appeal and they, they have the potential of transcending left and right. So the challenge is, is recovering them, I guess. And those would be, you know, immigration restrictionism, uh, infrastructure spending, foreign policy, kind of, right? foreign policy restraint. Yeah. And, and kind of like, you know, appeals to appeals to American patriotism. I don't know how else to really describe it. So there's this kind of ongoing debate right now in this postmortem of the 2020 elections and the 2021 runoff about, you know, was it economic factors that drove um, people to the polls for Donald Trump or was it this kind of, you know, patriotic identity stuff? I mean, I think that not only is, is, it, is it not either or, but I think that the overlap is pretty heavy in as much as, um, you know, people who are who are more blue collar and working class tend to be more, um, patriotic and, 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 um, you know, supportive of American history and American identity and things like that. Um, then, you know, either, either like baristas with master's degrees or, uh, people working in HR departments or things like that. But I'm curious both what you think of that kind of juxtaposition, first of all, and second of all, I'm curious as to your thoughts on how it may or may not have driven Latino turnout for Donald Trump and sort of what the appeal of, um, you know, American flags and appeals to the founders and things like that are for uh, Latinos. So I think the first two things are connected. I think patriotism and protectionism or the economic concept that the interests of the American nation ought to come first, and that all other things are subordinated to that. So not free trade, this idea of a kind of a system that is ostensibly mutual and neutral. No, not that. So I think the first two things are actually connected. And I think that there is an attempt right now that started actually around the time that Trump lost to perhaps actually separate economic populism, so protectionism and things like that, from the Trump phenomenon, and instead to reduce Trump and his movement to a kind of cultural movement. And there are a lot of problems with that in my view, because again, I've, I've argued that they're connected, and, and second, I think if you look back on the Trump moment, the argument that Trumpism was solely cultural is it's flawed for a number of reasons. So first, if you look at what Trump's most popular promise was, the thing that his voters said in 2000, in early 2017, uh, in a Gallup poll, asking which of Trump's platform promises is the most important to you, it was infrastructure. That shouldn't come as a surprise to people, but I think maybe right now it is because there's all this focus on the wall for whatever reason, maybe because the caravan, uh, yep. there's, there's a several Central American caravans coming our way, but no, it was actually infrastructure. I think on the one hand, because we are talking about re literally making America great again, right? And in a very real sense, we're talking about rebuilding bridges and roads and 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 fixing our decaying infrastructure. And on the other hand, there's a connection between infrastructure investment and jobs. You're talking about works projects, well-paying jobs for people, right? This is this this is like throwing a stone into a pond. There are all these ripples, manufacturing, all of these different things come into play here. Trucking, right? So that was the most important promise. It was also one of the things that was immediately sidelined and we never saw again. Uh, and instead of infrastructure, we got the tax cuts plan by right. the, a former Goldman Sachs executive, Gary Cohen. So 
that's a problem, saying that it's not economic. Actually, Trump's base was super amped up about infrastructure. So no, uh, the idea that they didn't care about populist economics, infrastructure spending, which the GOP is totally against, they, they axed it. Paul Ryan, who was still around back then, said, no, we're not going to do that. And same with Mitch McConnell. Like, no, we're not. Are you kidding me? Infrastructure investment? That's socialism. Yeah, that's, right. what they say to the, that's, that's what they say to the public, but it's in reality, it's like, yeah, no, we, we want to uh, blow money on other projects. Um, so no. And then the second part, that it's a cultural movement. It's like, well, what do you mean? Because sure, it started off as a fire breathing movement with a fire breathing figurehead who was talking about how illegal immigration brings murder and rape and drugs, which is true. I'm sorry to say, but a lot of that is true. And that's why it was so powerful. Uh, I think anyone who says that it was totally baseless and Amer- like Americans are all just angry and uh, racist people have completely missed the point that there's a lot of truth to that. And that's why Latinos in 2018, according to a Zogby poll, 58% of them said they agreed with Donald Trump's immigration views, even if they disliked him personally. So there's, there's your problem right there. Yeah. So early on, Trump is certainly this culture warrior, right? But by the end of his administration, what has he done? Apart from the, the uh, let's call it red meat rhetoric, we instead got criminal justice reform, the kind of thing that you would see under Obama or Biden. The the first right. step act, people still do not understand. And it, it's understandable that they don't understand because I, there's been a kind of cover that's been run for the first step act uh, in, in conservative media. And liberal media doesn't really talk about it because it's something that they like, of course, criminal justice reform, right? Uh, but But that was a phenomenal mistake. We, we changed the criminal justice system to favor these felons who m- made the hard journey of landing in federal prison. That's not an easy thing to do. You don't go to federal prison for like smoking pot once, which is, of course, what this is the narrative cultivated by the left and the right. You know, there are people in federal prison uh, who are there for like a first offense, like um, I think her name is Alice Marie Johnson. <laughs> so, so. She was she was one of these people who, uh, her first time getting into the drug business, she she became a drug kingpin who was working with Colombian cartels in Texas. So that's so it's framed as like, well, Johnson was a first time offender. It's like, okay, back up. She's a first time drug kingpin offender, right? And she she was someone who got out on the first step act, and that's not the only one. But so I guess my point is, um. To to reduce it to a cultural movement, it's like, what does that even mean? Because Trump finished as basically this really vanilla person who actually kind of moved the party to the left on really important issues like criminal justice reform, also on LGBTQ issues. In the final days of of the 2020 campaign, Trump was uh, spending tons of, or at least his his campaign was spending tons of time courting LGBTQ voters. Like, uh, Like they would have LGBTQ events with Tiffany Trump. It's like so that's that's a cultural movement. Like, well, that's we're in trouble if that's true. So I think there's there's on the one hand, this is the result of a confusion about what Trumpism is, and on the second hand, I think it's kind of bad faith. I think there are people who definitely want the party to go back to broke conservatism, call it Reaganism, uh, and who want to basically just use the electoral windfall that they got from Trump and take the party back to these ideas that are safe and comfortable with donors like the Coke industries. Yeah. And I, well, I I mean, this is the thing when you say, what do you like, what is the cultural aspect of it? I mean, I think that it's almost as if the the economic aspect of it is the driver of the cultural stuff, because it's less that like, it's more that, you know, the cultural appeals or, 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 or rather like what kind of the perception of the cultural appeals are. And I think that, you know, if we're talking about actual cultural appeals of Donald Trump that are, that are, in the wheelhouse of Trumpism, you know, it's things like, um, defending monuments, you know, or, or even just like super basic stuff that, you know, all Americans used to agree on, but, but now apparently we don't is like, America is not a fundamentally racist country. America is not, um, a force for, 
evil in, in you know in the world historically um white people are not sort of uniquely evil and things like this but i think that a lot of that is less that it's like trumpist than it's just sort of what like the average working class american believes right. and there were appeals made to that you know i mean uh, like uh, the mount rushmore speech i think was one of the one of the better moments of like this kind of culturally patriotic patriotic appeals but i think that they're not separable in as much as you know this isn't like some some outside thing this is just like what you know the way that i always phrase it is like guys who drive trucks and watch ufc um this is just kind of like what they think about the world and it's not this um you know kind of didactically ideological thing it's just like you know they like America and they like the American way of life and they right. like freedom and they like that they don't have to, you know, register guns or, um, you know, d follow, follow a bunch of, follow a bunch of rules or jump through more hoops to start a business than they already have to. And things like, things like that. Right. Yeah, no, that's all true. And I, my point is, is that, uh, you and I know those things. And I think there are probably a good chunk of people who identify as Republican voters or just people who identify with this this what we're talking about these concepts who understand that I, i'm talking more about the the movement itself uh in terms of uh i get ideology be, in terms of party leadership movement leadership because there is this disconnect um you, you know at the rnc convention uh this last year you had don jr say that the trump administration would quote put an end to racism right so you're saying that racism, that America is not this evil racist country, then why is Don Jr. saying that a Trump is going to end racism? What are we like, what are we talking about? What are we, what are we doing? And, and so my point is, is that I know what, it, when you say, you know, it's a cultural movement, I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, I would outline all of the things you just said, but is that what the, the effective leadership of the movement thinks a cultural movement is? Do they have any coherent doctrine? Do they understand that holding these ideas in their heads is an act of cognitive dissonance? We're the law and order party. You know, we're, the, we're the law and order movement that wants people to be safe, but also we're going to release super felons. Right. Because what Democrats did in the 90s when they were tough on crime was actually racist. It's like, do, do you hear yourself? You know, we're, we're for defending Confederate monuments, but also we're going to pass the platinum plan and make Juneteenth a national holiday. Right. It just it doesn't make any sense, and, I, and so I think so. We know people like us. We we do know what what the ideas are and what matters. And I think that there's a, a kind of fight right now to one separate the ideas from bad leaders, and also to to re uh, reiterate, not redefine, reiterate these ideas like we're doing now. Because again, it seems like common sense, but apparently it's not. So. Kind of dovetailing off of that, you know, there's this there's this phrase that gets bandied about a lot, and it's I almost like cringe even saying it for the purposes of talking about it. But Trumpism without Trump is like it's such a cliche at this point. Um, and I'm curious if you, to what degree you think that's possible, and what it what it looks like. I think it's possible, and I actually don't like the term Trumpism, and I've, I've I used it in an article published today. But as I used it, I winced because it's it's not. I don't think it's wise to reduce a movement that's much bigger to Trump to the Trump brand. So I think that's already something that I have a problem with, and I'm trying to break the habit myself. But but to your point, I think that Trumpism without Trump is totally possible, and all it would mean is going back to to where we began in 2016 and finding a more effective leader who is not in this Mitt Romney way, uh, air quotes, civil, which really just means castrated. Right. Or I'm, I'm not talking about we need a more civil Trump. I, I think that I think that Trump's the, the fire breathing aspect of Trump is, is, a, is a good and necessary part. I think that sometimes he, he would get too carried away. And when there are more important things on the table, he would focus on really petty disputes 
which right. sometimes this stuff is funny, but other times it's like, dude, th- like this is what you're, this is what you're hammering right now. This like personal beef on Twitter instead of, I don't know, the fact that Chad Wolf is running DHS as an immigration lobbyist and you're not firing him, you know? So I think that in my mind, this movement without Trump, Trumpism without Trump, we, we simply need a more effective leader, someone who knows how to exercise power better than Trump, someone who's more competent than Trump, someone who's more disciplined than Trump, uh, but not less aggressive. So that's what Trumpism and, uh, without Trump in my mind is. It's certainly not like Marco Rubio or I, I, it's actually hard for me to think of anyone in the GOP who could carry this mantle. So what do you what do you think about DeSantis then? Everyone keeps throwing his name around, and that makes me worried <laughs> because when someone gets elevated like that, you have to you have to wonder if there's something else going on. Uh, DeSantis seems I will say that he seems like the least bad alternative because I think it it took real courage to stand up to the lockdown stuff that was going on with the coronavirus, like DeSantis did. When Josh Hawley was eulogizing George Floyd and the rest of the GOP was kowtowing to George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter as a movement, DeSantis, if I recall correctly, passed a law that enables store owners to shoot looters. Um, I believe I think, that that's correct. I remember that as well. Right. right. So that like these things take stones. And it shows that DeSantis is pretty real, as real as you can get while being a Republican. Because there are still strings attached to being a Republican, I think. And there are, I think DeSantis is not free from those things. So, so again, I, I think he seems to be the least bad alternative, but definitely, I think the, the lesson that we can take from Trump is to not blindly worship and follow a leader, but instead the movement needs to be, the movement needs to remain critical of leadership because what we saw under Trump was a movement that became totally uncritical of Trump and therefore enabled him to do uh, the just really ineffective and, and, and counterproductive things. Yeah. I think that the thing with, you know, I mean, a lot of times I just feel like people tend to shift too far into one direction than another and that there's some, you know, balance tends to provide better um, analysis. And, and to your point about, you know, the worshipful, view of Donald Trump. I mean, I, I, I personally really like Donald Trump. I think he's a very like, you know, um, I, I find, I, I have a lot of, um, you know, positive feelings towards him as a person and his personality. Um, that said, I think that both the like, you know, 4d underwater chess stuff was nonsense. Um, and to an equal degree, the, he has absolutely no idea what he's doing stuff was nonsense. I think he was a lot smarter than his detractors gave him credit for, but I think he was, um, you know, also filled with a lot of flaws and things you talk about where like, he's very, very, uh, easily baited into getting distracted by, you know, well, I'm going to get into a Twitter fight with somebody, um, rather than sort of staking a, uh, principled stand on something that's important. Um, I think the thing about DeSantis is, you know, and I think that the, this is explains his appeal is that if you're looking for like, what does a more disciplined Trump look and act like? I think that that's kind of where a lot of the DeSantis appeal is coming from is like, yeah. okay, so he's a Donald Trump. He does the off the cuff speaking stuff of Donald Trump and the not bending over for the left stuff of Donald Trump, but he's not like, you know, fighting with some actor on Twitter for three days. <laughs> right. Yeah. And DeSantis does troll the media really well. Yeah. And, and he, but he picks his fights and he doesn't, right. he doesn't give them too much. There, there's a, a recent uh, altercation between him and a journalist and a journalist asked a question and then DeSantis started answering it and the journalist kept going and DeSantis was like, excuse me, are you, are you asking a question or giving a speech? And DeSantis like basically trampled over them, answered their question, and then wouldn't let them get another word out and left. And I thought that was like, that's that's perfect. That's how you handle the media. But he doesn't do that all the time because he has more important things to do. Right. So so I think that's so I think yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of appeal with DeSantis. But again, it's just the it's just the fact that the GOP uh 
the GOP, as weak as we think it is, and as as in- incompetent as we think it is, it it's like the Democratic Party in the sense that uh, when you're in the party, you there's kind of like dues that are owed, and there, like I said, there there are strings attached. But I like, but again, DeSantis seems to be the best bet, uh, in, in terms of like relative to Hawley and Cruz and Cotton. I think DeSantis is probably the best of, of all those people we just named. I mean, I like Matt Gates a lot, but Matt Gates is, is not going to be president. No, no, I don't think he's going to be president. No. And, and um, I, I think uh, he's, he, what, you can tell that he's just like a young guy, like the, the fights that he picks and the way that he, I think the way that he goes about things, it's just like, he, he still has more time. I think before he matures um, to, to kind of pick on something that I think is was a lot more specific, and I'm very curious to hear your ideas about. Um, I'd like to talk to the sexiest topic on earth, which is healthcare in the United States. Uh, big sarcasm there, but <laughs> you know, I think that this is an area where the Republican Party is extremely vulnerable, precisely because it has no alter, no no viable alternative messaging on the subject mm-hmm. of healthcare, and I think that Americans are, you know, sort of understandably distrustful of a national health care system of the kind that they have in the United Kingdom or in Canada. But I also think that it's clear to most Americans that what we're doing now isn't working. Um, obviously, Obamacare is a huge driver of, of, of the out-of-control health care costs in this country. Um, but it's not the o- it's not the only one, and I know that you are very critical of this um, kind of tick that the that the Republican Party has about constantly den- denouncing any government intervention in the economy at all as socialism, um, which I I agree with, and I think that there's a certain like appeal, like I think that the anti socialist stuff has some some degree of appeal. And I don't think that it's limited to boomers, but I think that with regard specifically to the healthcare issue, that it's completely toxic and prevents them from formulating any coherent alternative to a total government takeover of the healthcare system. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that and how the GOP can present an, an alternative that can get 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 the vote out. I think you're right about the. There's just something about the. Indie communism that is it's just so part of American culture, right? Like I right. I still catch myself uh making references to Cold War themes and I mean my newsletter Contra is named after a video game that was named after uh anti communist gorillas. So there you go. But it's also true that most Americans are open to something like universal healthcare so long as a private option remains. And Trump himself has been a proponent of universal health care for years before he became president. In fact, during the debates, Cruz attacked him on universal health care and Trump uh, stuck to his guns. And it wasn't until I would say maybe 2018 when you saw Trump start attacking universal health care as socialist. And by that point, Trump became captive to the GOP orthodoxy that he ran against in 2016. But again, even into 2017, Trump is still sticking to his guns. And I think that in, in some ways, the attacks on him by establishment Republicans as being a socialist for saying, look, healthcare in this country is really messed up. We need to do something about it. Uh, and I think that the fact that he was attacked as a socialist for saying that actually helped him. It right. made him more attractive to moderate voters who also are just confused and re- repulsed by the GOP just taking this really anti-life position on healthcare, you know, and at the same time they're doing that, they're also working with like the American Enterprise Institute, which is this think tank uh, intellectual organ of the Republican Party is working with Purdue Pharma to push Oxycontin on kids. So, so the GOP's answer to healthcare is like, well, we just need to make the distribution of Oxycontin as liberalized as possible. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. And anything Anything to the right of that is socialism. It's like that that's a winning platform. And I, I think that, well, going back to the Trump point, many people in mainstream new, like like this, I think Spectator uh, USA, not spectator.org, uh, Spectator USA ran an article saying that if Trump 
embraces something like uh, like something like universal healthcare while retaining the pub, uh, the the private option uh that that he the the GOP would achieve lasting dominance for the foreseeable future because that's how important this issue is for so many people and i think that's true and of course he abandoned it but um my wife is german and germany has a system that's like this there's a everyone has access to this public system but then there's also private options and now you can't copy and paste germany's model onto the united states because there are social cultural demographic differences that make that difficult but i think the party and the person who take takes this challenge seriously and and who offers a vision of of a better healthcare system that is not just deregulation for purdue pharma but something that instead goes to war with these corporations and also goes to war with the politicians who are in their pocket, I think that that person is going to, that might actually be the way to to have a second Trump instead of going the way of immigration, because I think Trump unfortunately made that issue really toxic in part because he talked so much about it that it enraged the left and he never actually did anything about it. That it, I think it created all these problems that we're going to be dealing with for the, for the future. But I think that one way forward would actually be to take up healthcare. Uh, especially because if you look at like life expectancy among white men in particular, life expectancy has actually declined for the last few years in a row. So, and, and uh, in large part due to uh, not just suicide, but also uh, like all these different health issues uh, ranging. A lot of it has to do with uh, deaths of despair, unfortunately, but I think the point still stands. Healthcare is a huge issue. And it remains a kind of untapped issue for the GOP that does not look uh, – maybe that would be something good to look at for DeSantis to see what he thinks of healthcare. I don't know. Yeah, and I think that also like pharma is probably – you know, I, I'm not aware of any specific polling, but I would bet that pharma is less popular than Congress and Congress tends to be <laughs> constantly unpopular. Yeah. You know, I think especially after – um, everything that came out with the, with the Sackler family and yeah. the opioid crisis, you know, I don't think that there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, um, sympathy for won't someone think of the poor <laughs> pharmaceutical companies <laughs> yeah. and their right to, you know, get you hooked on, uh, opioids, um, you know, at the age of 12 or, 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 or yeah. whatever. <laughs> um, true. so yeah, that, that, that could be it. Um, this is another kind of like, you know, one of these, one of these topics that is, has been a bit done to death, but I'm still curious to hear your, your thoughts on it. Do you think that the Florida party is the model for the national party going forward? There's a lot of rumblings about like, we just need to look at Florida. We just need to look at Florida. And, you know, what do you think about that? I'm not sure. I I think that part of that, of the, we need to look at Florida thing has to do with Latinos, because Florida, I think for some Republicans, shows that one, a realignment is possible, and two, demography is not destiny. Right. But I'm, I'm not really convinced of that. I think that that's a distraction. Because I think that for some people, this is coming from the right place. It's coming from a sincere concern that demography is just going to inevitably crush the Republican Party in whatever form it continues to exist. So these people, I think, like I said, have their heart in the right place. And they're not just cowards who are looking for a way out of addressing things like immigration or crime, because those things really quickly become debates, or at least the left and liberals try to make them debates about racial uh, iniquities. Like immigration is going to be framed, is already being framed as an issue of racial justice under Biden. So, okay. Those people set aside, I think for many people, especially in the establishment GOP, that's exactly what it is. It's a kind of out, like the future is Florida. Therefore, we should soften on immigration. We should be more open to amnesty because we need to, because we can win Latinos and just think of how many more we could win if, if, right, we're, a little, right. if, we're, if we're a little bit more compassionate on immigration. This is what Dana Perino was saying in the lead up to the 2020 election. On Fox, and I actually went on in uh, the, one of the few times I was on Tucker's show, I, I, I went on and counter signaled, counter signaled Dana and because I, I wrote an article about how, well, the article was titled Carissimo or uh, Conservatism. 
And my view was that Dana Prino and Carl Rove are completely wrong when they say that one, all Latinos care about is anti-socialism, and two, Latinos are attracted to people who are not so tough on immigration. I just pointed out that there's like very little data. Uh, there's actually a, there's a lot of data that shows the exact opposite in terms of immigration. Like during the pandemic, at its height, 69% of Latinos said they were in favor of a complete immigration moratorium, which was higher than I think their white counterparts. And that doesn't same, surprise me in the least. And it was the same thing for for uh, deploying the police to uh, deploying federal troops to assist the police in putting down rioting. In June, I wanted it was either June or July. Gallup ran a poll that found something like f- more than fifty percent of Latino Democrats. I think it was ABC News. Not Gallup was a different poll. It was a poll that found that more than 50% of Latino Democrats said they were in favor of deploying the feds to assist cops in putting down the rioting. 60% of Latinos overall said the same. And again, I think in both cases, they were more willing to say yes than their white counterparts. So this idea that Latinos are attracted to soft leaders, like that's not true at all. Like, have 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 you heard of Latin American strongmen? It's just you know this, right, this, right. This this is a this is the funny thing about demography is destiny, right? It's like it, the GOP, it, like you you like you think that you're going to be exempt from this. Like no, Trump is proof of this, and, and the fact that Hispanic men supported Trump so much, it's like what you're seeing is this kind of atavism that you've imported from from Latin America, right? These people that are uh, supportive of these like strongman leader types. It's like yeah, they. they this is this is good. Our politics are, are going to become more belligerent, I think, uh, which I don't have a problem with. To be frank, uh, to be completely frank, I I think that actually we need something more like a like a, a caudillo. But like I said, I think for establishment Republicans, it, it's either a, a cope or bad faith. Like they just don't want to touch immigration anymore, and I, and I think that's why there's supposedly there there are one more amnesty. A kind of amnesty that's in the works before Trump leaves, and we'll be—I guess—we'll be seeing it in the next few hours if it's going to happen. Um, and I won't say more than that, but yeah. So that's my view. Be uh, be wary of establishment Republicans. I think that I think that's all. I think that's all right on the money, and I think that like you know, I I like um, I like appeals to you know, what people have both called in, in positive language and in, and in sort of derisive mocking language appeals to the multiracial American working class. I, lo- I love to see that stuff, but I hate it when it's done in this stupid pandering kind of way, like, oh, yeah. well, Latinos, they, they want open borders, right? And it's like, no, they don't. Have you ever talked to one? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, they want people who are, you know, they want like a Marco Rubio. And it's like, it's the last thing that blue collar Latino voters want is like somebody like, uh, Marco Rubio. I, in, in my opinion, um, winding down here, I have a kind of, uh, I, I, sometimes I like to end it on a lighter question and I would like for you, cause I know that you and I both have in common that we're both into lifting weights and synth wave. And so I would like you to recommend three anabolic synth wave tracks for anyone out there who may be, uh, lifting weights to the synth sounds. Let me pull up my playlist because I, so I run out of my newsletter. I started this, this thing where I would create a news, uh, a new playlist with, with each newsletter. Uh, and I quickly exhausted all of the good synth wave, I think. So I'm on, I'm kind of on standby until some new, some new stuff drops, but the tracks that I've really enjoyed lately, storm city by cloud battalion, I'm trying to trying to name new stuff because I've recently expanded. I, I used to pretty much only listen to like Gunship, which I think is a really good band. So I would, I'll just throw them out there as a as a band that you should listen to, Gunship. But in terms of different tracks, Storm City by Cloud Battalion. Uh, she only exists in dreams. Uh, sorry, Screens by Dead Life and Neural Hub by Shortwire and Chris Kea. Those are three tracks that I think, one, I've really enjoyed them. And two, I think that people who are maybe not into Synthwave, and this is like the first thing that they might listen to, would get a pretty wide range of sounds from these three 
from these three tracks because they're all pretty different. Uh, but I think they're just generally enjoyable. Like Cloud Battalion does some pretty, uh, it, it's like, uh, it seems to sound like a mixture of synthwave and orchestra. So it's really impressive. And I think if, you, if you're if you into like movie sand- soundtracks like Hans Zimmer, you, you probably will like Cloud Battalion. Neurohub is just a fun song to listen to and it's good for working out. And She Only Exists in Screens is also just a fun song to listen to. And it uh, it's just really catchy and it's got, uh, yeah, I think it'll just get your attention. Outstanding. Pedro Gonzalez from American Greatness. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? So until I get nuked on Twitter, you can find me <laughs> at uh, Emeriticus, E-M-E-R-I-T-I-C-U-S. But for all of my interviews and articles and all of my social media contact info, you should go to my newsletter which is at contra.substack.com. And that is contra, like Iran contra.substack.com. And again, anytime I do an article or an interview, I post it there. And I've also got some paid content coming out. I'm doing an interview with Paul Gottfried that will release on January 26th about conservatism and post-conservatism. And so you can find that there. Thanks again for joining us on the Resistance Library podcast from Ammo.com. Anybody looking to save a little money on ammunition, I know it's hard to find these days, but we have got it. You just go to Ammo.com forward slash podcast where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on the Resistance Library podcast. Mm